We're going to keep it moving. Our next speaker um, is a pretty interesting dude. Similar to me, he's been in the industry a long time. I've been in 18 years. He's been in it 16 years. He's got a very diverse range of experience. He's worked as an agent. Uh, he's worked in the wholesale side and marketing and so forth. He's run a call center, and he's developed tools for agents that we can all use to do better at what we do. Um, he's out of Arizona. He is, well, he's the king of automation. And I'm going to bring him up here and let him tell you all about that. Please give me a big round of applause for my good buddy, Mr. Eric Fierro. What's up? All right, I want to peep the cameras real quick. So I want to let you know I'm going to be walking in the front. I don't know how Justin stood still that whole time. He is a man, but the Latino in me makes me want to walk back and forth. So I'm going to be pacing. I'm going to be pacing. Now, two things. First, uh, I'm going to shut off my cell phone because for some reason, my two buddies, Christian and Andrew, think it's funny to call me every time I get on stage. <laughs> they called me when I was at Thrive on stage. Andrew called me. Christian called me at Medicare Con. So I'm sitting here talking to everybody, being all serious, and my phone is buzzing like crazy. So my phone is off, buddy. It's, <laughs> I am not going to get a call from you today. So I have a QR code up here, and unlike Tony, if you scan my QR code, you will automatically be enrolled in a DFY CRM, and you'll be charged 97 bucks a month. <laughs> I am that good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I always like to offer my presentation. I, I obviously, I love to speak utilizing presentations, and so if anybody wants it, uh, you can scan the QR code. You'll have the presentation sent to you guys shortly. I will, I will let you know ahead of time, I won't send it right away, because I don't want you jumping ahead of me. So, I'm excited to be here in Salt Lake City. First time, this place is awesome so far, city of sunshine, right? Because you guys noticed the sun didn't go down until 9.30 last night. That was wild. Like, I was, I probably felt like, I, I thought it was maybe like 5 o'clock when I was riding around on a scooter, and it was really like 8.30. That was, that was a weird experience, but it's pretty cool. You can get a lot more done in the sunshine. So I need to grab a clicker real quick. Is that back here? Okay. And so is the best thing to do is to point this way to click? Okay. That's what I'm going to do. So you got a lot of great speakers, right? The lineup has been stacked. Christian Brindle has done an amazing job with bringing his industry buddies into this conference. And... You've heard already some amazing material from sales, from marketing, technology, and you're going to hear a lot more amazing things today. So I want to do something a little different. In the past, when I get up here, I normally do the same thing. I talk about sales. I talk about marketing. talk about technology. I talk about client retention. But today, I want to talk actually about something a little more personal to me, and that's about starting over. I want to know if I could poll the audience, how many of you guys here have ever had to start over in your business? That's awesome. And maybe some people are like, well, why the hell is that awesome? <laughs> You're going to find out here during my presentation. But it does happen. It will most likely happen to the majority of us that at some point in our careers, we'll have to start over. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you about my process and my journey and how I've had to start over. And I want to share with you guys a little bit of insight and things that I learned along the way. Because the best thing that any of us can do when we fail at something is get back up, learn from our mistakes, and then reapply it to make ourselves better. So I've had to start over three times in my Medicare career. How many of you have had to start over three times in your Medicare career? One person. Okay. Well, then the others, yeah, you got some catching up to do. <laughs> the first time that I had to start over was for opportunity. The second time was a result of acquisition. And the third time was for passion. And again, there's a lot that I learned in these all three times that I had to start over that I think you guys can learn from ahead of time. Maybe avoid some mistakes I made, or maybe you'll resonate with what I'm going to talk about because it happened to you too. First the opportunity. I got recruited into the insurance industry back in 2004, which is quite a while ago at this point. And if you don't mind, I want to tell you a little bit of a story of how this happened. 
Okay, is that cool with you guys? Can I tell you a story? Okay, then I'm gonna get into story mode real quick. It was a warm, sunny day in Tempe, Arizona. <laughs> my wife, Jessica, the love of my life, was working at a Paradise Bakery in the Tempe Mall. It, she was very unhappy with her position there. Not at all loving going to work every day, but she did it because she's a hard worker. As she goes, it starts her day, she's ringing up people at the cash register, when all of a sudden, two strangers walk up and place an order. These aren't any strangers, because these two people changed the course of my life forever. Here's what happened. They walk up, they order a sticky bun, they order some soup and salad, and they go along their way and eat. My wife's the one who rings them up, provides excellent customer service as she always does. And when she finished, she went about her day not knowing anything different. These two strangers in the night went over, enjoyed their food so much that they came back for seconds, but they had ulterior motives. You see, as they came back and specifically asked for my wife, they said, Jessica, because she had a name tag, they didn't ask, she had a name tag. Jessica, you know, I just wanna let you know, you did such an amazing job. We are so happy with how you took care of us, the service you provided us, and how you made us feel. In fact, we are so impressed that we'd like to actually invite you to the opportunity of a lifetime. Now remember, my wife at this time She's a little more susceptible to the BS because she's very unhappy in her job. So these two people said, we want to actually show you, and fortunately tonight we have a meeting. It's our Tuesday night meeting at 7 p.m. If you come to this meeting, we can show you how to make six figures. We can show you how to start your own business. We can show you how to change your life. Wow. My wife said, does this like involve sales or something? <laughs> and they're like, mm, no, not really. I mean, you know, but, but we can, we're gonna talk all about it if you come to the meeting. And she goes, well, if you are talking about sales, my, my husband's actually more suited. I mean, this sounds awesome, but he's more suited than I am. I'm more introverted. I'm not sure that I wanna be a part of this. She's like, they said, well, you know what? Bring your husband, that'd be awesome. Because if both of you are there, you can both make the decision together. And so what she did is she came home to me and I was also in a position where I wasn't too happy with what I was doing in life, but she comes home, she tells me this opportunity, and I said, all right, that sounds cool, let's go check it out. So we drive over to the office, to their Tuesday night meeting, and we see these awesome people get up there, and they're talking all about how their life has changed ever since they joined the organization. They show me these fat diamond rings, they show me how not only are they six-figure producers, but also seven-figure producers in their business. Now, if any of you have any flipping clue what I'm talking about, raise your hand without screaming out, just raise your hand. I just want to see if you guys already know. Okay, so I'm going to continue for those who don't know. This amazing opportunity sounded too good to be true. And I got excited because then I said, well, what? this is awesome. All these people make all this money. What the hell are you guys doing? What are you selling? What is the, what's the deal here? And they said, you, well, there's a few things we do. First, we can help families with refinancing their mortgages. Oh, shoot. Okay, refinancing mortgages. So we're gonna be, we're gonna be like mortgage processors or mortgage lenders, what are we gonna be? And they said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Oh, cool. I'm down with that. I think I could do that. Okay, well, here's the other thing we do. We help people buy term and invest the rest. Now, that's a hell of a catchphrase. <laughs> buy term and invest the rest. So, if for those of you who don't know what that means, is that traditionally, if you buy a whole life policy, you're normally gonna gain some cash value in that whole life policy over time. Well, this company believes that instead, you should buy a 30-year term policy at a much cheaper premium, and the difference between the whole life and the term, invest in some kind of vehicle over that next 30 years, and you'll make way more money than you ever would in whole life. That's the pitch. So now I'm thinking, oh, so wait, I'm a mortgage, processor and I'm an insurance agent? They're like, yes, yes. But that's not all. 
And I'm thinking to myself, damn, these guys, okay, so they got me going to the three verticals now? No wonder they're rich. So the last vertical, my favorite vertical, you need to build a team. Okay, what does that mean? Like, I got to go employ people? Like, I don't even have any money yet. Yes, you need to build a team. What you're going to do is you're going to do exactly what these two people in the night did. They're going to go to different places. You'll go to restaurants where people serve you. You'll go to shoe stores where you buy your Foot Locker, your, your shoes. You'll go, to, you'll go to anywhere, car washes, anywhere that you go to daily spend your money, and you will basically look for those people who are excellent at what they do, and you will invite them to the same exact opportunity. And I'm just thinking, um, but I don't know if this opportunity works yet. Like, why would I just start doing that? Like, I got to make money first. Well, then here's the fun part. The next step is I need you to make a list of the closest, the, the, the 20 closest people <laughs> that you have in your circle, family, friends, neighbors, anybody that you talk to on a daily, anybody that trusts you, I want you to make this list for me. And then we're going to start calling and setting appointments to go talk to them about not only this opportunity, which, again, I'm like, I'm not trying to go recruit my family yet. But we're going to talk to them not only about this opportunity, we're going to talk to them about mortgages and insurance. And I was down with the other side. Okay, if we can help them with maybe refinancing or help them with some life insurance, I'm down with that. So I made my list of 20 people. My wife makes her list of 20 people, which a lot of our people are the same people, so it ended up just being... It wasn't 40 people for them. It was more like 25. (laughs) We make this list, and they give us a little script to start calling and making these appointments with these family members and friends. We did it. Then we go out, and we start getting ready to do a presentation. Now, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm excited. We're going to go and do a presentation. This is the start of my new career. And uh, the crazy thing is I got so excited before I even did anything, that I quit my job to do this full time. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. I did a lot of praying that year. (laughs) So we, we go out to our first appointment, and it was my mom. So I wasn't too scared, but I was wondering why I actually didn't get any kind of presentation booklet, right? I'm just like, are we winging this? They're like, oh, we got this taken care of. You just, you just come, come along, join, and, and learn from us, shadow us. Okay. So we get there, and my mom is my biggest fan, and she's supporting me in everything. So as we're there, she's like, okay, mijo. If you want me to refinance, okay, I'll refinance. If you want, you want me to get some life insurance, I'll get some life insurance, Okay. And then I talked about the opportunity. Well, they talked about the opportunity, and she's like, and forgive my language, but my mom is a little bit of a potty mouth. She's all, what the fuck is this? <laughs> what is this opportunity? I, don't, I already work at Intel. I don't need this. I don't need that. Yeah, it's a chingadera, yeah. <laughs> my mom didn't buy into it. She didn't buy into it at all. <laughs> but she still got the life insurance. She still got the mortgage. And then the next appointment we went to was to see my wife's parents. And again, they were supportive, and they got a refinance done. They bought some life insurance, and then they pitched them the opportunity. And I'm sitting here starting to get a little bit red in the face. I'm a little embarrassed. I'm like, I don't know that this is going well. My, now your parents are also saying, what the hell is this? Like, okay, I understand that you want me to buy some insurance and refinance my mortgage. Why, why do I have to? You're saying you want me to go out and do the same thing? No, no, thanks. I think I'll pass. The last appointment I went on, was to go and do a presentation for one of my best friends. Justin actually mentioned him earlier. His name's Tegre Moot. And because he's one of my best friends, he said, yeah, come on over. You can present for me. The funny thing is, he already knew what was going on. A little punk. I think he just wanted to mess with me. So we, at that point, because he was my best friend, because I already knew that he was in the insurance industry, I said, um, I was talking to, I don't know whether you should call your up on the RVP or whatever. I said to him, I want to go by myself with my wife. Just me and my wife will go and do the presentation. You can hang back. I'll let you know how it goes because I, I don't want you pitching him. 
So I go over and I do my presentation. At that time, by that time, I had like more of a booklet that I can flow through, go over everything. And by the time I was done, pitching them the mortgage, pitching them the life insurance, pitching them the opportunity, he just so sweetly smiles at me. He's like, buddy. <laughs> um, I'm really impressed with your presentation. I mean, it was really good, but I'm not going to buy any of this. Honestly, this product is trash. And so my face got beat red. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, bro, I'm sorry to let you know, but you're in what's called an MLM. I was like, okay, what is that? She's a multi-level marketing organization. It's more of like a, some people call it a pyramid scheme, but it's a triangle, right? It's where, it's where and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in a second, but basically he just said, listen, you're not really like in what you think you're in. And I said, well, my friend, please elaborate for me because I quit my flipping job <laughs> to do this. And if you're telling me I'm not actually selling insurance, then what, am I defrauding people? And then she's like, no, 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 no. I mean, these are actual insurance products you're selling. They're just not that good. There's better out there. What I want to tell you, though, is that pay attention to something. Where do you make your money in doing what you do? Do you make it in selling the products? And I was like, well, there's some money to be made in selling the products. Like, what is it? What's the commission? I told him the commission. He's like, that's pretty low. Okay. And so what about the refinance? I told him that. He's like, well, that's actually also pretty low. Oh, okay. He said, but, but really, where do you make the money? Like, where do they really, what do they, what do they pre impress upon you the most when you're going to these meetings every Tuesday? And I said, recruiting. They want me to recruit. Recruit, recruit, recruit. Okay. Well, Eric, do you have to pay money to be a part of this program? Yeah, they charged me like 200 bucks each for me and my wife, and we did it, even though we didn't have it, credit card. And he said, that's right there. That's where you make your money. And if you work for an organization where the majority of your money is made on the recruiting by making people pay to join you and not the product, that's when you know it's an MLM. And it was after that meeting that I decided I am done with Primerica. <laughs> so I'm jobless, have a mortgage. My wife's still working at Paradise Bakery, so we're living off of that $7 an hour. And I'll tell you this, if any of you guys ever come across a situation where they're talking more about the recruiting, recruiting, recruiting in order to build a business, make money, and, and here's the key, here's the key, because listen, in our insurance world, we are in somewhat of an MLM, but we can only go so deep. We only have so many levels. So when they tell you that you're supposed to recruit wide and deep, like go deep, 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 and it goes like 15, 16 levels deep, that's when you know you're in an MLM. And if you do hear that, that's not a red flag, my friends. That's more like the air horn you hear when a tornado is about to hit, that <laughs> Run, run. Hey, let me ask you guys a question. Speaking of tornadoes, and then I'll get back to my presentation. Why'd the screen turn off, by the way? Oh, okay, thank you, thank you, sorry. How many of y'all live where tornadoes hit? Raise your hand. What's wrong with you guys? <laughs> They're fun? I was at a conference in Missouri, and all of a sudden, it's 3 a.m., I'm sleeping, and an alarm goes off, like meh, meh, meh. Get downstairs, get downstairs. Do not take the elevators, get downstairs. I was like on the 10th floor. So I had to run down 10 flights of stairs to go to their basement at three in the morning so that if a tornado struck, I wouldn't die. Why do you guys choose to live where you could possibly die at 3 a.m. sleeping? It's ridiculous. But God bless all of you. That's why you're entrepreneurs, because you're brave. <laughs> you're wild. You're wild. All right. 
So that was, that's how I got into the industry, okay? That's how I got recruited into the industry, and uh, it was a wild ride. After that, I basically I only had my life insurance license. I didn't tell you the worst part. When they did refinance and they did write that life insurance, I wasn't licensed. I didn't have a license for either one of them, so I didn't even get paid. They got paid. They got paid. I didn't get paid. They... All right. I started in Medicare in 2006 selling dual eligible plans. So... Full circle, I go try to sell a few other things. I sucked at it, and my buddy looks at me and said, man, you are just selling the wrong product. I need you to actually try selling what I sell. Come learn about Medicare. Come learn about our opportunity. So what I do, I went to one of the carrier crash courses, because back then, our training for Medicare was way different than the training you get today. Yeah. Way different. I spent two hours in a room learning about real quickly what the hell Medicare Advantage is, how to sell it, who qualifies for it for this dual eligible opportunity, and then they give me a presentation book, which is at least a lot better than the last company did. So now I'm armed with this presentation book. I get a list of leads. It's time to start calling. It's time to start putting in the work. So I, at the time, I did get another job out of desperation. Okay? Because, again, as I was telling you, I wasn't doing too well in the other sales arenas that I kept trying to dip into. So I got a job at a place called University of Phoenix. And I will forever be thankful to the University of Phoenix because it helped me to get me back on my feet. I jumped in at a job that was paying me $25,000 a year. It was enough to help me to pay my mortgages, make sure I could feed my family. And, and, I, and, and, and I was happy that I had the opportunity to climb a ladder, which by the way, it is the worst thing in the world to have to climb corporate ladders. I absolutely hate it, but it, at least I had the opportunity. So quickly, within six months, I actually went into management and I got a raise from 25,000, and this was a huge raise. I got a raise from 25,000 to $28,000 a year. So now making $28,000 a year managing 20 other finance, uh, what they call them, finance counselors. And again, I become very unhappy, right? Even though I'm able to pay my bills, I'm still pretty unhappy with what I do every day because I'm just a glorified bill collector. And I don't know if you guys have ever tried to be a bill collector or if a bill collector has ever called you. If you're an entrepreneur, it's likely a bill collector has called you. We've all been there, right? <laughs> so you got bill collectors calling you and you're trying to avoid them, but when you get them on the phone, you know, they're just like, ah, oh, Mr. Fierro, it looks like you still owe blah, blah, blah. You know, can you pay today on your credit card or by check? You know, they just go right into it. They're salespeople too, right? Because they don't, they, they don't even really ask you like, hey, can you pay your bill? They're just saying, do you want to pay your bill by credit card or check? It's a close right there. So anyway, the point of that is that I hated being this glorified bill collector. It was rough. And that's when I talked to my buddy Teg again, and he said, listen, Let's try out this insurance thing, okay? We'll get you trained up, we'll get you some leads. What you're gonna do is you're gonna call these leads at lunchtime, set some appointments for the evening, and then you'll go out and you'll hit it. You'll crush it. So I give it a shot. The reason I wanna tell you this, because this is, it, it, it makes me now, in hindsight, laugh my ass off, but in the time, wasn't too happy. I go to my office at lunch, I call on the leads. I set three appointments, three appointments the first day. And I'm so excited because I'm like, okay, these guys said yes, they'll see me. And I got my presentation book ready. I've practiced the hell out of this presentation. I know that if I get in front of anybody, I'm closing. So I head out, I go to the first appointment, and as they open the door and welcome me in, I'm thinking to myself, you don't look 65. Okay, this was, a, this was a, um, an Indian couple and I'm just thinking, man, I was like, you guys got good genetics because you don't look 65. You look like you're in your 40s. And they laughed, and I said, because I actually said that to them. I said, you guys got good genetics. Like, you look like you're, you're 40. And they're like, yeah, we are 40-something, you know? They're like, you're here because our mom lives with us, and she's the one who would likely get, get the plan. So I do my presentation, and I kill it like I said I would. When I was done... I didn't, I didn't at that time have the, the, the closing techniques that I do today. So I just said, okay, when I was done, I was like, what do you guys think? You ready to do something today? And they look at me and they say, you know, Eric, you did an 
excellent job with this presentation. I mean, it was top notch. Great, great job. But we're not going to get this insurance today. We're going to probably just keep what we already have. But I do have an opportunity for you. <laughs> yeah. I'll be right back. I'm going to go get my presentation book. They got their presentation book, and they pitched me on another MLM. And I'm just like, are you serious right now? I was like, you, do you have a, I want to punch you. But instead, I walk out the door, and I just head out to my next appointment. The next two appointments were no-shows, and so you could chalk that day up to a pretty bad day. So I'd go home, soak in my tub, thinking about, like, man, maybe this is just the sign. Maybe I just need to stay out of sales. And so I'm soaking, my wife comes in, she's trying to pep talk me and be like, you know, honey, you can do this. Like, you know, I know that sucked, but you gotta try again. And I'm just like, hell no, I don't. I, at least I got a job still. At least I didn't quit my job this time first. <laughs> you know, let's just keep going down this path. So <laughs> we basically, um, we get a phone call. It's my buddy Tag, and he's like, hey, I wanna check on how your day went, man. He was so excited. And I was just like, why are you so excited? Like, let me tell you what happened. So I told him what happened, and he laughs. And he's like, that is, he's like, of all the people that this could happen to, it happened to you. He's like, that is just too funny. So I'm sorry that happened, but listen, we're best friends, right? You do stuff for me, right? I was like, yeah, of course, man, you know that. And he's like, okay, try again tomorrow. Make your appointments tomorrow. Do it all over again. Just please do it for me. Because at that point, I was. I was, I was gassed out. And I said, okay, I'm going to do it for you. Next day, reluctantly, go into my Little office, close the door, make my appointments, get two more. And I'm not as excited this time, but I'm like, you know what, I'm going to do it, though. At least they said yes, to let me see them, let's head out. So I head out to my appointments, first one I see, kill the presentation like I did before, and this time they said, where do I sign? Woo! Yes, first sale down. Woo! Next appointment, pitch them, do a great job. They asked me the same thing, where do I sign? Done, second sale. Now I'm excited, I wanna start calling leads at nine at night because I'm so excited, I'm ready to go. Next day I go, I was able to set three more appointments for the, net, for the for in the evening, went, closed all three of them. Next 10 sales in a row I was able to close and now I'm as excited as can be because I'm like holy shit, I can do this. I can do this. But I had to persevere, right? Because sometimes it can be easy to quit when we get knocked down. It can be very easy. Because that feeling we get inside when we're deflated, when we feel like we're not capable of doing something, is that feeling that stops the majority of us from reaching our potential. And I want to tell you my story because I want you guys to understand, if any of you know who, my, who I am, and as I'm telling you my story through this journey here, I have found success, and I do very well in life, and I have what I want, and I'm still reaching for more, but it is because I had to, at some point, tell myself, you know what, Eric, that sucked, and bad days will come, but I can do it, and so can you. So the crazy thing, though, about being in the dual eligible market is that you have to go into some pretty sketchy places. I want to know how many of you guys have been in some sketchy ass places. How many of you know what the smell of dog piss in a house is like? How many of you know? Well, yeah, how many of you know? How many of you know the crunch of a roach when you're walking into a house? <laughs> You walk in and you walk in and you, it just looks like the dogs have run the house, right? They're just chilling, smoking a cigarette, right? You got the dog smoking a cigarette, just you're like, oh, I got to piss, you know? And it walks over, hikes its leg wherever it wants. They run the house. They run it. If you guys know, so if any of you sold in the dual market, having to go to kitchen table, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But at the same time, it was these valuable experiences. They're still valuable, right? There's always a silver lining. But this is an environment, though, where I became incredibly compassionate towards the senior market, towards seniors in general, truly. The conversations I had, understanding their history, understanding what they've gone through, I mean, these are things that changed the way I saw everything. 
Because as a young guy in my 20s, who maybe at the time think, thinks that I do know everything, right? I talk to these people who've already lived their lives. And they're telling me about their experiences. And I'm learning from their mistakes. And it's those things that just truly made me so compassionate and made me want to really help this market more than ever. I was sold, guys. I was sold that this is the market I absolutely wanted to be in because it checked all my boxes. Why, which, what are those boxes? Well, let me tell you. First, I got to help people. That was my number one thing. I got to help people. Second, it paid really good. <laughs> so that's a great combination. Helping people, and it pays really well. Third, I got to earn what I was worth. If I decided that I didn't want to go out and work my ass off, if I decided that I didn't want to hustle as hard as I could to make as many sales as I could, then it's on me, right? My paycheck was a reflection of my hustle, and that is huge. And the last, it's a recession-proof market, right? Justin was mentioning recession earlier, and it's like, well, the cool thing about our market is that regardless of recession, because we've ever been through some, I've been through a couple, and we still got to sell insurance. People still need their health insurance. We're in an awesome market for recessions because people will not give up their premiums or give up their insurance because they're struggling with money. We, they need this product. So this market has been great to me. Here's what I learned, okay, from just that first experience, which was a pretty crazy one. I want to give you guys permission, and you should give yourself permission. I don't even know why I need you. You guys don't give a flip, but... I think you should give yourself permission to stop being so self-conscious. What does that mean? I would say, and again, please understand, I've worked with thousands of agents, not 20 agents, not 100 agents, not even 500 agents. I've worked with thousands of agents in my career, and I can tell you that 90% of them, where they get hung up, especially when they're getting started, they're scared to pick up the phone. Raise your hand here when you started. Were you scared picking up the phone? Right? Let's talk about why you were scared picking up the phone. Number one reason? Rejection. You're scared of being told to kick rocks, right? You're, still, you're scared of being told to pound sand. You're scared of someone dropping F-bombs on you. God forbid if you don't cuss ever, then that's really going to hurt. <laughs> Here's the other thing. A lot of us want to actually know everything everything before we make calls. We want to be the expert. We want to make sure that when we call, if they bring up any objection, we already have a rebuttal. Nobody could catch us off guard. Hell no. I'm a master of what I do, right? That's what we want to be. That only comes with time, my friends. So I want you guys to give yourself permission to stop being so self-conscious. And I know there's some people who don't like when I cuss up here, but honestly, it's like what Tony Robbins said before. Sometimes it's those cuss words that just really emphasize what we're talking about. And the best advice, the career-changing advice, listen when I tell you this, the career-changing advice that I got was, Eric, you just need to stop giving a fuck. That changed the course of my career, I promise you. And that doesn't mean you don't need to care about consumers. It just means that you need to stop being self-conscious. You need to be able to just pick up that phone and hustle. Holy smokes, I've been talking for a while. Okay. <laughs> you need to have a correct expectation set, right? You're going to get more no's than yeses. This is sales 101, but sometimes you need to hear it again. You will get more no's than yeses. A lot of us who are incredibly intelligent say, well, I'm going to try to be the outlier here. Like, I'm going to try to actually figure out how to get more yeses than noes. Why does it have to be that I get more noes than yeses? And so you waste so much time and energy trying to figure out how to get more yeses than noes, but at the end of the day, it's just a better avenue. Like, I don't mind if you try to figure this out. Figure it out after you got a base built. Figure it out after you actually have clients who residuals are coming in, taking care of your bills, helping you to grow. That's when you should figure it out, not when you're first getting started. We're in a 100% commission environment, guys. If you're not selling, you're dying, okay? Activity is king. Yes, I'm the king of automation, but activity is king. My good buddy who was running the call centers with us, he always told that when he was training the team, activity, activity, activity. 
You need to stay busy doing income generating activities. You have to be making phone calls. You have to be talking to people because the more people you can talk to, the more presentations you get to make. The more presentations you make, the more sales you close. The more sales you close, the bigger your check. You have to make sure you're staying active. If you wanna make more money, you do have to spend more money. Maybe you don't like hearing that. Maybe you want to figure out a way around that. But this is, again, a staple in the industry. There are caveats, but for the most part, you do have to spend more to make more. And if you can't spend more, well, look for other creative options. That doesn't always mean that you just have to quit. You can work for another badass who can provide you a foundation. And yes, you might have to give up some, but they're giving you a foundation, they're giving you an education, they're feeding you the leads, and all you have to worry about is perfecting what you do best, and that's making sales. LOAs, that position gets demonized more often in our industry than it should. It is actually an incredible route for so many people to go and get started and become perfect at what they do, and then they can decide to go out on their own. LOA should not be demonized. There are bad apples out there. There's bad organizations out there, but there are also a lot of good ones, and we have amazing forums now, like the Six Figure Medicare Agent Facebook group, where you can go and just ask, hey, I need to look for a position like this. Who do you guys recommend? The second time was for acquisition. Now, I'm gonna speed up. I know I'm short on time, but I will speed up, okay? The second time was for acquisition. The second time I had to start over. I decided in 2007 I wanted to still continue selling, but I also wanted to work with my best friend because they had a position in their marketing organization working for the FMO, and he said, dude, I'd love for you to join. And I said, dude, that means we're gonna talk to each other all day long? Like, not just like a couple days a week, like we're gonna see each other every day? And he's like, yeah, yeah, it'd be so fun, man. We're gonna go kill the market together. And I said, well, sign me up. But I gotta be able to still sell because I love selling. I think I'm a better marketer if I can sell because then I know what they're going through. And that way, if I'm teaching them what I'm doing, then it's going to go a lot better and more revenue comes into the company, blah, blah, blah. He said, deal. So I joined them. And it was a lot of fun. But it was also a great learning experience. So I saw this, though, as a great way to earn some steady income because as a marketer, they brought me in at a small salary. So I was like, cool, I get a steady income. That'll help me with reinvesting in leads, right? That'll help me to, to, to keep paying for what I'm doing. But I also had room for growth. And that was a big deal for me. I want to have room for growth within that organization and obviously continue to grow on the sales side as well. Here's what I learned. Make sure that if you do something like this, position yourself in a way where you can earn a set amount of, you can earn a piece of the pie that you're bringing into the door, right? So I was set up in a way where I actually got a commission for every, every agent I recruited as they started producing business and that uh, override money started coming in the door that I would get a percentage of it. That was big. That means I was able to have a path to six figures within the marketing organization as well as while I was selling. That was a big deal for me. Learn other areas of the business that are vital for growth because if the company is trying to grow and you're a big piece of it, find ways to help that company grow. That's a big deal. And a lot of people don't think about that. They think about just one track minded. But I always thought about it like I want to figure out other ways to bring revenue in here so that they think I'm a movie, not movie star, a rock star. I'd rather be a rock star than a movie star. Treat the business as if it's your own. This is a big deal. So a lot of people go in again. You, you have your set job. They tell you what to do and you do it and you might do it great. But what I did is I treated that business as if it was my own. Even though it belonged to my boss, I wanted to treat it as if it was my own. And how does that look? Well, normally, it's mostly reflected in your work ethic. It's reflected in the ideas you bring to the table. It's reflected in the long-lasting relationships that you build. And in my case, it was with insurance agents. Here's what I learned. If you get a chance to manage people, do it. And even if you don't end up liking it, there's still a lot to learn from it, OK? Make yourself invaluable. That's the point I'm trying to make with what I said when you basically come up with other ideas, how we could bring revenue into the thing. But you got to make sure that if you do that, you, you got to be doing really good at your current position. You can't like suck at your current position and be like, hey, boss, here's other ways that we can bring more money into the, into the business. And he's thinking, why don't you just like do what you're supposed to do and bring money that way? So you got to be a rock star at what you already do before you start doing that. 
If you're working with consumers, make sure they love you. Always stay in touch with them, right? Touch them multiple times a year so they remember who you are and don't go anywhere else. And that way, when they're calling back into the company, they want to work with Eric, not with just anybody. They're looking for Eric. And if you're working with agents, make them love you. Make them want to be loyal to you. And if you can help generate revenue and grow in other ways, again, like I mentioned earlier, do it. Here's what I learned. What I... Um, what started as wanting to work with my best friend, it turned into a place where I could hone my skills, share my skills, and eventually move into a director of marketing position. I spent 12 years helping build someone else's business, okay? 12 years I spent. Now, it turned into a position where I could actually eventually go ahead and buy the company when he retired, okay? But along came integrity. <laughs> you all know, you all know, along came integrity, and I don't. I don't blame my boss. When I saw what was being offered, I said, bro, you got to take that deal, man. You got to take that deal. Integrity are great people. I got to meet Brian Adams. He actually interviewed me. And uh, I remember, I'll never forget this, okay? And this is on camera, okay? So Brian, um, you, might, you might say that's not true, but it is true. I remember, okay? Because I was, I was very excited when I heard him say this. But he interviewed me. I told him about what I do and in the company, wore a lot of hats. And I remember him saying, Eric, I don't know what to do with you, man. <laughs> He's like, you do so many awesome things in this company, but I just don't know where to place you within our company because he was offering me a position at Integrity with the acquisition. And I was really like, I was impressed with myself at that, at that moment. You know, here is the CEO of Integrity telling me that. And I was like, man, that's pretty cool. I like that, right? <laughs> but I did have, I did have a, to make an option. Okay, one minute. I'm sorry, Tony. I'm sorry, Josh. I'm sorry, both of you. But um, I did have to make a, de a decision. Join Integrity, which is, again, an awesome opportunity. They offered me a great salary, offered me great, uh, just, it was, I should have said yes, <laughs> right? Most people probably would have, but I decided I wanted to bet on myself, okay? I wanted to bet on myself because I already had this vision in my head of what I wanted to do in the industry. So I decided to go off on my own. So the third time I had to start over, though, was for passion, right? So after the acquisition went through, I decided I was going to start building a call center with my partners from Heartland Financial. Started from scratch, and again, what a great opportunity to learn. I thought I knew a lot about the industry, but when you build a call center, you learn so much more. It was an awesome opportunity. I got to utilize the university that I have in a whole different way because anybody we were hiring was going through my university. That's how they learned about Medicare. They learned by training on my university. I beefed up my university because of that. And so it was just, again, a really cool feeling that people who were coming in and selling on the phones and helping us bring business into the company were doing so because they learned Medicare from moi. That was awesome. I also generated over 150,000 leads for our call centers. That was another huge learning process for me and also a great opportunity, and I learned so much. But after 12 years of pouring into independent agents, I was now pouring into call center employees. I don't have time to tell you about the difference between the two, but there is a huge difference, okay? And I found out that, I'm gonna tell you real quick what I learned here. What I was doing was a recipe for burnout. I was wearing too many hats, I was taking up too much time, and guess who was suffering? My family. I wasn't gonna let that happen again. So I decided I'm gonna start pursuing what I wanna, what I'm gonna pour into is what I'm most passionate about, and that's where we're at today. Today, I run the Senior Sales University online training platform and selling system. It comes complete with tools. And this is not a pitch, Christian Brindle. All I'm saying is that I chose to focus my efforts into this because the other I was getting burnt out on, and I wanted to do something that made me passionate. And guys, working with people like you is what I'm passionate about. So I love what I do now, okay? And I did realize I didn't man like managing employees. I'll say it out loud. I don't like managing employees, okay? At least sales employees. It's difficult. It's, it's, it's a whole different beast. So I want to just tell you what I did enjoy. I enjoyed figuring out how to get people to respond to me. I enjoyed marketing. I enjoyed how to utilize the latest tools and automations to help the process happen even better. And I enjoy teaching independent agents. 
Okay. Uh, when COVID first hit, I saw a unique opportunity. I offered my university for 60 days free to anybody who wanted to learn how to sell over the phone because people were scared that they, if they were at the kitchen table, they were like, how the hell am I going to keep making money to, to feed my family? I said, I'm going to give you away. You can not only learn from my university, you can have access to my tools for 60 days to be able to just get up and running. And so many people took advantage of it. And so many people learned how to sell over the phone. And so many people kept feeding their families through COVID because of this. All right. And I don't regret, okay, I'm, I'm done here, Tony. I don't regret, <laughs> I'm sorry, Josh, I love you, buddy. I, do, <laughs> I don't regret any of the time that I spent building other people's businesses. Hear me when I say that. I learned so much from doing that. I am who I am today because I chose to do that. I do not ever want to take that back. And I'm so happy for the journey that I've had in this industry because here I stand in front of all of you because I went through all of that. So to conclude, confidence doesn't come from knowing, it comes from doing, okay? That's a big, big deal. You can't just watch universities all day long and think you're going to be an expert. You have to put things into practice. Sometimes it may be better to give up a little to learn a lot from somebody who's been there and done that. And as a business owner, you need to always be growing and always be evolving. And life is like a box of, uh, no, that's not what I wanted. Um, <laughs> even though what we do isn't sexy, if you fall in love with aspects of what you do, you're going to find a great deal of enjoyment and you will fall in love with what you do as a career. Okay? So that is my time. I'm sorry for going over. I love you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs>